evening. Welcome to the fourth part in our series, uh, Unveiling the Gospel. Last week, we looked at how the gospel is a grace uh, for the new life. We saw that how God had to uh, find this perfect man to put the sin of the world upon him and, and, and punish him so that the sin would be punished in order that his, his creation, his, uh, the mankind he created out of his own love, out of his will, out of his desire would be reconciled back to him. And he, he, he sacrificed his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, thereby crucifying the sin. And when Jesus was, was raised, uh, the death was defeated. So sin was defeated and death was defeated. And man was given a choice to confess, to acknowledge and put their faith in Christ so that when they would do that, that the Spirit of Christ would dwell in them, the Spirit of God would dwell in them, and God would then see them as holy, as righteous, not because of what they do, but because of who they are, not because of their deeds, but because of their identity, because of their position. That was the, the part of gospel that we looked at last week. Now, that raises a question. Now that the Spirit of God, now that I have, I have put my faith in Christ, I'm a new creation, um, and the Spirit of God dwells in me, and when God sees me, He sees Jesus, and therefore I'm reconciled to Him. Now the question is, does that mean I can do anything and whatever I want? Does that mean I can go on sinning? Does that mean I can do whatever I want to do in my life? Because, hey, God has forgiven me. God has forgiven me. He's forgiven me everything, every sin that I can imagine if only my, uh, my repentance was genuine. If God has forgiven me everything, that why can't I go on sinning? Why then should I pursue holiness? You see, a similar question was asked to Apostle Paul by the Christians in Rome. And this is how Paul responded. Let me read for you. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. He said, Now the law, law came in to increase the trespass but where sin increased grace abounded all the more so that as sin reigned in death grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord so where sin increased grace increased chapter 6 verse 1 what shall we say then are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Should we continue sinning that we constantly receive the grace of God? Because grace of God has been given to us in abundance. Paul says in verse 2, by no means, certainly not. Don't even think about it. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know for all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, so that, just as Christ was uh, raised from dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. What Paul's argument here is that if you are dead with Christ, so once you put your faith in Christ, you have that moment of repentance where you say, okay, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, Upon that moment, upon your confession of faith, you die with Christ. Baptism is a beautiful imagery. You die with Christ and you're raised again. Just like Christ was raised to new life, you are raised with Christ to this new life. So if you have this new life, you've been raised again, you've been given a new life, you are a new creation, how can you go on sinning? Death is defeated, sin is defeated, then how can you go on sinning? That's the argument of Paul. Now, do you see a tension here? Do you feel a tension going on here? The tension is that if I am a new creation, if I have put my faith in Christ, then how am I sinning still? How am I still every day constantly corrupting and violating the good that God has created through my actions? Is Paul lying? Or is there something wrong with me? And the answer is no. A capital N-O. Let me tell you why. See, think of sin as this twofold thing. First, 
think of sin as the roots of the tree that hold the tree. And that is sin with capital S. All right. And the second thing is see sin as a fruit, the fruit of the tree. See that as a sin with the small s. Now, when Christ died, when he defeated sin and death, he cut the roots. The roots of the tree were cut. The dominion of sin, the rule of sin that shackled us and enslaved us, that was taken away. But the fruit of that tree of sin, with a small s, still remains. Why? Because we still live in this flesh. This flesh is corrupt. This flesh is sinful. So you would ask, what's the difference then? You see, the difference is that earlier when you were without Christ, whenever you were tempted, you would sin because there was no motivation, there was no power, there was no desire. Remember, Paul said that we were dead in our sins. We were enjoying our sins. So there was no motivation for us to do good and not sin. But now with Christ, whenever you are tempted, because you don't have the roots holding you, when you don't have the shackles of sin enslaving you, you can say no to sin. You have the power of God in you as a spirit of God motivating you, empowering you, encouraging you to say no to sin. The dominion is gone. The residual effect is still there. The question is, so what am I to do now? You see, when Christ gave you a new life, when you became a new creation with him, he restored you. And remember, we said that our purpose is, is, is in God. So when you became a new creation, God gave you his purpose. And his purpose is for us to glorify God by becoming Christ-like. Our purpose is to glorify God by becoming Christ-like. The question is, how do I become Christ-like? How do I become Christ-like? Well, you've got Christ who's got really lofty standards, sinless perfection. How do I become Christ-like? And the, the, the answer is that God is making you Christ-like. He's using every detail of your life. He is using every moment of your life, every hardship, every struggle, every refreshing moment of your life to form you into the image of His Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. He has taken you out of the clutches of sin and set you on the path of becoming Christ-like. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, in verse 28, he says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. NLT, the New Living Translation says, we know that God causes everything to work together for those who love God and are called to God, uh, according to his purpose. For what? Verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So everything in your life, every incident in your life, good, bad, ugly, sad, joyful, every incident in your life, every detail of your life, God is using. He, is, he's, he being the sovereign was, is directing all that traffic in your life to take you to that one place where you're formed in the image of of Christ to be Christ like so does that mean that am I to do nothing does that mean am I to just sit back and enjoy God doing what he does the answer is no the answer is no Paul says in Philippians 2 13 he says work out your salvation with fear and trembling and don't get this verse long Paul is not saying that you've got to work in order to get your salvation. He's saying you've been saved, now work out your salvation. In other words, live a godly life. Live a godly life. You have received grace, you have received mercy, you have been saved, now go live a godly life, a good life. Paul also says in Ephesians chapter two, he says, for you are God's workmanship created in Christ 
for good works created in Christ, new creation. For what? For good works. You see, we are called to do good works. A man's character, a man's philosophy, a man's belief, his worldview can, is, can be seen in his actions. The way people will know that you are the disciples of Christ is not by how much you know, but what you do. People will know and will see Christ in you, not by your belief, but by turning those beliefs into action. You see, Jesus did not just preach. He healed. Jesus did not just preach. He had compassion on people. He provided for people. He stood up for people, marginalized, the poor, the afflicted, the lost. He turned his belief into action. He presented God. You see, he was the image of God. He was God. And so he brought forth the character of God of the one as compassionate, loving, kind, generous, peaceful. And at the same time, angry when he saw sin and when he saw corruption. We've called, God has called us to act out our faith. Let me put a word of caution right here. You see, this grace of God that has permeated our life, it's an inconvenient grace. It doesn't leave us the way we are. It transforms us. That's what the grace of God does. Now, remember that this grace you have not received by your merit, by your good deeds. You don't deserve it because God has given it to you while you were yet sinners. You know, he did not wait for you to become better or become perfect in order to give his grace to you. He gave his grace to you so that you could become better, so that you would become holy. He loved you while you were yet sinners. So your works does not grant you the favor of God. If you think you can get favor of God or if you can earn the favor of God by doing good deeds, uh -uh, that's not how it works. Because God, right in the first place, did not give you His grace because you deserved it. He gave you His grace because He loved you and He wanted to reconcile you. So your salvation does not, uh, your works do not sustain your salvation, nor does it sustain your salvation. It doesn't gain you salvation, nor does it sustain your salvation. So what does the grace of God. So why should I do good works? Because your salvation did not cost you anything, but it cost God his son. You see, the gospel is not just the grace for new life. Gospel is this grace sustaining you to live this new life so that you might do good works and be transformed into the image of his son. Let me close this week by uh, reading the scripture from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The life that I now live in flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, in our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself up for me. God's grace sustains your salvation. It gives you salvation. It sustains your salvation. And it's an inconvenient grace because it transforms you into the image of God's Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless.